it's great to be back here in, in my hometown, uh, Lemuria. And I want to start off by um, thanking the people at University Press of Mississippi, who have been awesome to work with. And until today, all of them but Steve were names. You know, <laughs> constantly with him for two years, I guess. And now I think I can remember which faces go with each name. And they've been terrific to work with. It's been a real joy. And uh, my other, all four of my books are by four different publishers. So it's been a fun journey, but I just have to say these people are a great team, and it's been wonderful working with them. And Lemuria, uh, Kelly, and everybody on the staff here is always so helpful and wonderful at the events. And Jackson folks for coming out. It's such a literary town. I will say, I live in Memphis, and uh, literary events are not as well attended in Memphis as they are in Jackson. It's just not, you know, we lost the Southern Festival books a few years back to Nashville. So we need to do something better up there. Y'all do a great job down here. I'll also say that we're going to have a panel in the City Book Festival in August for this book. So I hope to see some of y'all back again there. Um, and Southern Writers on Writing, 26 Southern authors spill their guts on the art of the craft. Why is it important that we're Southern? Do I feel that we have something to prove or just something to offer? Maybe a little of both. A few years ago, I was driving down Highway 6 that connects um, Interstate 55 with Oxford, and I saw one of those big billboards that said, yes, we can read, a few of us can even write, even write. You know, it's part of the Believe Mississippi campaign. And the more I read about the campaign, they listed about 20-something authors, I'm thinking it was 27 authors, you know, Pulitzer Prize winners and so forth, who are all Mississippi authors. And I started thinking, there's at least that many more, you know, that have been following in their footsteps, let's put together a collection of them writing about their craft. And it was really exciting, the 26 people invited who agreed to contribute, or 13 women and 13 men, and I Googled and the press Googled and the venture <coughs> hadn't been done. Couldn't believe there wasn't a contemporary canon of, of such writing, and now there is. This book isn't just an attempt to show up the ignorance of those who live a little in the South. It's a joyous celebration of our culture and the writers who bring it to life <coughs> on the page as they create a contemporary canon of Southern literature. It was important to me to have diversity in the collection. There are four African American writers. There are four poets. Uh, most everybody else writes fiction. Ralph Eubanks writes nonfiction. And they hail from nine states, and, and even Florida. <laughs> Hitchhiking. <laughs> but 
Now, what we have in common is we are all Mississippi writers. We're very proud of that. And I think we all have a real love for, for writing. Jim said in his essay, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing. By the way, there's a reason this is the first one in the book. It's really super. Um, I'm paraphrasing here, but he said that when writers start out, they usually start doing it for fun. And if they keep on and they continue, then it's, then it's for passion. And I think, then I think that's true. Whether you've got to love this or, um, or you won't be any good at it. And I've heard that, that really if you, uh, if you don't, I mean, if you don't, if you don't love, if you, don't, if you don't love what you write, you should be, if you can quit, if you can stop writing, you probably should. I think that's probably good advice. One thing I do differently from these folks is, uh, as soon as it's trying short stories, I write almost all short stories. I grew, I grew up in, uh, I grew up in the 50s and 60s watching these little TV anthologies, the Death Valley Days, and uh, One Step Beyond, and Outer Limits, and Twilight Zone, and <laughs> Albert Hitchcock Presents, those little half I just love those things. And, uh, and they, they weren't series, they were just they were different stories every week with different people. They could all be <coughs> told in 30 minutes, start to finish. They all had a definite beginning, middle, and end. A lot of times they had a little surprise end, and I just loved that. But I never grew up. I still love it. And uh, so I write mostly suspense, suspense stories. And I think the best thing about that, you kind of wait for the other shoe to drop the whole time. It's so much fun. It's so much fun to do that. And uh, I talked to Bill Sass for a lot of time at night. And uh, the students used to ask, some of, them, some of those guys are here tonight. And uh, they used to ask if there's a formula for doing that. Is there a formula for fiction, short or long? Well, there's not a formula. But there is, uh, there's structure. You know, there's a, there's kind of a process. And and to oversimplify, it's uh, you get the man up the tree, you throw rocks at the man, then you get him down. It's not, it's not enough just to get somebody in trouble and then rescue them. You got to make it really hard for them while they're up there. Y'all don't feel hard with probably. He's, he said he keeps a, a little sign above his computer that says makes make things worse. <laughs> you got to complicate things as much as you can before you finally get these people out of the fix you put them in in a way that's hopefully satisfying to, to the reader. But the whole puzzle thing there of, of genre writing, of commercial, I just love it. So it's a lot of fun. A lot of fun to do. I'm supposed to read a little bit in plan mine here. I'm supposed to read a little bit here. And I'll just pick out a few, a few paragraphs and then enough for me. <coughs> I've said here that maybe the biggest reason, and by the way, y'all know this already, but Mississippi has the uh, the highest percentage of, of published writers per capita, you know, than, than any state. And I've heard, in fact, I saw an article on this one time, that Greenville has more published authors than any other city. And the nice thing, really, you start thinking, you start thinking about them, start adding up. Yeah. There are tons of, of writers from Greenville, Mississippi. But maybe one of the biggest reasons for the abundance of authors from the South, I think, is that Southern kids grow up listening to a lot of different people tell stories. Or at least they used to when I was a boy. Our storytellers were relatives, friends, relatives of friends, friends of relatives, <laughs> old timers, co workers, whatever. Some were folks we'd never seen before in our lives or we'd never see again. <coughs> Nameless wanderers who happened to stop by for a glass of tea or a plate of food on their way to points unknown. Those vagabonds would now be called homeless person. Back then they were called homo, we called them hobos, which to us meant they were adventurers who had traveled the globe and seen things we could only dream about. I can recall sitting at their feet beside the bench in front of my grandfather's gas station in Saddus, Mississippi. It's on Highway 12 when you ran guys this country. And, and just wide eyed and gullible and marveling at their tails while they munched nabs and Tom's toasted peanuts and sipped RCs. Bought for them by my granddad from the coke machine inside the shaded office. Most of their thrilling accounts, I realize now, were pure, pure fiction. <laughs> but I can remember some of those to this day. I, I can't I remember some of those to this day. Did those stories influence me to later tell my own tall tale? Sure they did. Especially in my short, small town mysteries or their laid back style, that kind of thing. Did they make me a good storyteller? Well, maybe not, but they made me want to be a good, a good storyteller. And, uh, one other thing that's uh, good or bad, and with or without many literary alumni, the South is a unique world. It's a place with a deep commitment to family, to community, to religion, a 
place where most folks still respect their elders, say grace before meals, have at least one relative named Bubba, and feel free to drop in unannounced at anybody's house at any time, except maybe my pistol packing cousins up in here. Earlier in here, I mentioned that, that a cousin once said that that since there was since there was a law against shooting somebody, shooting a trespasser, unless he was in her house, she said she would just she just by God shoot him and drag his ass inside the house. <laughs> <laughs> so we got crazy, we got crazy people. We all of us grew up with crazy people. And I think that's one of the things too that makes Southern writing kind of, kind of interesting. And I pointed out here one time that I've um, I don't know where it is, but I pointed out one time that I've been I've been to bookstores all over the country. I've never seen yet a section in a bookstore called Northern Fiction. You know, there's a fascination, there's a fascination somehow with the writing of the that. And I'm proud to be a Mississippi writer. I'm proud to be here with my friends talking to y'all about this. And especially, I'm proud to have been included. And Susan did a super job with this book. So thank you. And thank y'all for coming.
I'm going to skip and just read a couple of paragraphs from mine. Uh, mine has to do a lot with, I hit, I hit uh, Oxford pretty lucky in the, in the 1980s when uh, Barry Hanna and Willie Morris and Larry Brown were all three living in town and publishing and writing their novels, short stories, books in Willie's case. And I had not yet maybe come out as, <laughs> as a writer. I was you know, still trying to be, I was in the closet. There was no conversion therapy. Anyway, what a natural, unnatural, unseemly urge it is to write. Who do we think we are? What part of the brain houses such a narcissistic, parasitic proclivity? Is it the same region that encourages child molesters or IRS agents? <laughs> when does one come out to friends and family as a writer? Is there conversion therapy available? Just what is the deal? Or as our acronym savvy kids say today, WTF? <laughs> it's enduring conundrum why Mississippi has produced so many writers. A place so impoverished, violent, and ignorant, the sentiment goes, can't possibly be home to minds capable of great art. If you subtract Mississippi from American arts and letters, you'd still have hip hop and Stephen King, but America's canon of arts would be much poorer. Who wants to live in a world without Elvis? <laughs> Taking Mississippi a category a step deeper, my adopted hometown of Oxford, Mississippi, one finds an inordinate slice of the writing pie. Anywhere from 30 to 50 nationally published authors associated with this town of 20,000-ish. All right. Barry Hanna. Yes, Faulkner dis discussed the notion in the interview, in an interview about scratching the wall of immortality is why we may write. What he said was, quote, what matters is at the end of life when you're about to pass into oblivion that you've at least scratched the kill Roy was here on the last wall of the universe. <laughs> Barry Hanna agreed, telling an interviewer that writing is a way to, quote, not be rolled over by time like a crab in the surf, end quote. <laughs> Hanna also acknowledged the scary aspects of writing, the putting yourself out there for all the world to see, the fear of ridicule or disparagement, or worse, cold indifference and dismissal. Regarding such fears, he had a typically Hannah S. to the jugular answer. Fuck fear. <laughs> <laughs> That's tough love, baby. It helps if you have so much fear piled on you that you break loose from sheer exhaustion of being scared. I remember those long ago days in Greenville. The closest I ever came to experiencing domestic terrorism was swimming lessons. We had a public, of course, segregated swimming pool at the town community center at age six or so, they start you out in the shallow end with your first chopping strokes, dog paddling. This was beginner's class. Then on to intermediate, where you began swimming laps, freestyle, kicking and stroking in unison, ex exhaling every other stroke. Looming over, over all this was the high diving board, located over at the deep end, separated by ropes and safety floats. But it may as well have been 20,000 leagues under the sea. <laughs> when I dared walk over there where the sixth graders were diving and swimming like fish, I saw to my eternal consternation that in the deep end, you could not see the bottom of the pool. <laughs> there was no reassuring drain visible to gauge the end of the pool, or for the world for that matter. Gazing down through the chlorine waters of the deep end, my young impressionable self imagined it was very possible there was no bottom. Then you just kept swimming until you entered a point of no return and drowned in a bottomless pit. They'd assign your dressing room basket to somebody else. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll finish with, uh, Susan was very nice to mention my book, uh, The Statue and the Fury. It just came out in 2016. I had the fear, as Hannah talked about. I had not figured out the F-bomb fear. Thing. But I finally overcame and said, I've got to do this because the anniversary of the statue was coming up and I wanted to have the book read. Um, and as soon as I, I, and I've been carting this story around for 20 years. I had all these interviews. I had the little uh, answer machine tapes that you can do recordings of, interviews with uh, Faulkner's daughter, Jill Faulkner, uh, Summers, all these people. And I sat down to write it after hauling this stuff around for 20 years and the first sentence was great. <laughs> Yeah. But after that, I thought, oh, oh I, I can't write. <laughs> what am I going to do? Um, I wrote it, it got published, I've had a lot of fun with it. And then I came across this.
this interview that Barry Hanna did, and I keep coming back to him because he's my hero and he's the reason so many of us think it's okay to be crazy people because he did it so well. He did an interview with the Oxford American, and here's what he said, and I will close with this. Every book I've written I can't bear to read. I open the pages and they just seem like they're about 15 degrees below what I intended. You've just got to get over the fact that what you write is going to be imperfect. You've got that dream, that gem-like flame you want to apply to something you've seen or something that's been in your heart a long time. And the first sentence murders it. It's not going to be quite what you want. It breaks your heart a little. I understand that Muslims would put a deliberate imperfection into the pictures they created because only God was perfect. Well, I don't have that trouble. <laughs> Thank you so much.